Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. As I said, uh, my name is Savina Chacheva. I'm the program manager at the Cancer Wellness Center. Um, for those of you to, uh, new to the Cancer Wellness Center, we offer um, free support, education, uh, and um, wellness. The support includes counseling and support groups. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the center or getting connected to services, you can visit cancerwellness.org. Um, and then, as I mentioned, this program is being recorded. So for anyone just joining us, um, your, your audio will be disabled for the beginning, but we'll have a chance at the end to ask questions. Uh, you're also welcome to use the chat feature. Um, so without further ado, I would like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Akil Seth, um, who will talk about uh, breast reconstruction this evening. Evening, everybody. I'm sorry that we can't all be sitting here together in person, um, but uh, I appreciate all of you stopping by and sharing a little time with us here tonight. Um, as uh, Savina said, thanks for the introduction. I'm going to be talking about breast reconstruction. Uh, let's go ahead and share my slides here. Um, and uh, as I'll talk about in the talk here, um, you know, obviously this is a, a very unique group. Um, you know, with the Cancer Wellness Center in terms of the, the people that it, uh, you know, sort of uh, helps to support, as Davina mentioned. And uh, I wanted to make sure that this was a talk that was relevant, because uh, as I'll sort of highlight as I go along, you know, breast reconstruction is obviously a very wide and a broad topic, and it's talked about a lot. And, uh, you know, the, the relevance of it, relevance of it uh, can vary depending on sort of where you are on the stage of your sort of breast cancer care. And so um, I wanted to sort of make this a little bit more unique, and so that hence the title of the talk of you know, sort of understanding your options for, you know, revision, delayed reconstruction and maintenance, you know, not just sort of understanding how breast reconstruction works, uh, you know, from the get-go, but really sort of what happens sort of in the long term as well, um, or if you haven't had breast reconstruction to this point. So, uh, so we'll kind of focus on some of those things, but we will start by talking about, um, you know, kind of general concepts around breast reconstruction so everyone's on the same page. Uh, I don't really have any disclosures uh, relevant to this talk. Uh, just some background about me for those of you who do uh, know me or don't know me. I see a couple familiar names on the uh, on the uh, call tonight. Um, so I uh, did my training uh, both college and then medical school at Johns Hopkins on the East Coast. Um, I have then spent time here in Chicago doing general surgery downtown in Northwestern. Um, did my plastic surgery training out in Boston uh, at the Harvard program and then uh, decided to finish it all off with one more year um, out in uh, New York at the uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, uh, really focusing primarily there on uh, breast cancer, you know, uh, reconstruction after breast cancer, um, and you know, general reconstruction of microsurgery. So, uh, sort of fairly well, uh, you know, trained in sort of this area, which has led to kind of the practice that I have now. Um, uh, for those of you who are familiar with North Shore, uh, who are, or have had your care at North Shore, uh, we are a large hospital system. This slide is sort of antiquated at this point. As these are our four primary hospitals, and obviously we have a number of affiliates now between uh, Northwest Community, Swedish, um, and now the recent addition of the Edward Helmhurst Hospital. So, uh, so growing, uh, you know, within the system, I primarily work out of uh, Evanston and Highland Park, um, as well as our clinic out in Northbrook. For those of you who have been there or know about that. Um, so my practice, uh, you know, 80% sort of general reconstructive surgery. Uh, of which, you know, most of which has become sort of primarily breast reconstruction. For those of you, again, who are familiar with North Shore, I uh, work with all of our great breast surgeons, Dr. Pat Xiao, Cope Cash, and Winchester, uh, as well as patients from uh, the outside, from affiliated surgeons. You know, we see a variety of people uh, that come to North Shore for uh, our services, and as we'll talk about kind of the way we do breast reconstruction, uh, some of the services that we offer that other people don't. Um, and then 20% of my practice probably sort of general kind of aesthetic cosmetic surgery as any plastic surgeon may do, uh, face, breast, and body, uh, Botox fillers, all of that kind of stuff. So, um, I do want to acknowledge real quick again, as Savina mentioned, you know, the Cancer Wellness Center, you know, as someone uh, who was previously not familiar with it, I was introduced to it through colleagues of mine. Uh, you know, again, this is really just from the website, but, you know, the, the services they provide obviously are tremendous in terms of addressing sort of physical and emotional you know, components that come with cancer uh, and providing the services that they do, you know, of those sort of different things that they provide, obviously the goal of this talk tonight is really just education, you know, to be able to provide you guys with um, information um, that is uh, maybe not something you've either heard about before um, or something that is different with regards to, you know, uh, breast reconstruction and sort of what happens, uh, you know, either when you had it again or sort of uh, what your options are sort of after the fact. 
And then I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, obviously, uh, this being Breast Cancer Awareness Month and today actually being Breast Reconstruction Awareness Day. Uh, so apropos that we're sort of having this conversation, this talk tonight. Um, you know, as many of you may or may not know, breast reconstruction really has become integral to the, uh, you know, care of breast cancer patients um, and rates of breast reconstruction are increasing across the country. So, um, you know, that sort of leads to what I do and, and what we focus on at, uh, you know, in our practice. So, um, so again, just want to kind of take an acknowledgement of that and, uh, you know, um, acknowledge it especially for all of you who, who may have been or, or are going through breast cancer currently. So as I already mentioned briefly, um, you know, the outline for this talk, really there again, there's no shortage of presentations of breast cancer care and breast reconstruction, but there are really you know, very few talks that I've seen even in sort of uh, you know, the medical uh, set of meetings and things that I've attended uh, talking about sort of uh, what happens next. Um, and so we really wanted to make this presentation sort of relevant to the people who are on this call tonight um, and people that have either gone through or are going through breast cancer treatment. And so we'll talk about, again, the basics, you know, to understand sort of when I see someone in consultation for breast reconstruction, what do I talk about with them um, and how we do breast reconstruction really in a nutshell. Uh, so we'll kind of sort of breeze through that quickly. Um, and then we'll kind of focus on the main points of the talk, which we're talking about sort of delayed breast reconstruction. What do you do if you haven't had it but are interested after the fact? Um, maintenance of an existing reconstruction and what that looks like depending on what you've had done. Um, and then revision of reconstruction. If you've had reconstruction and sort of what your options are sort of moving forward. So just the basics. Um, some of these slides are on the busier side, I apologize in advance, uh, but again, there should be hopefully plenty of time for questions at the end as we go along. Uh, so breast reconstruction following mastectomy, um, there really are two forms, um, as you may or may not know, immediate versus delayed reconstruction. Uh, immediate really has become the vast majority of breast reconstruction in the United States. Um, and this is you know, reconstruction that is done at the same time as mastectomy or lumpectomy. We'll talk about both as we go along. Uh, delayed reconstruction, uh, instead, uh, in contrast, is a uh, reconstruction done at a separate stage, you know, uh, following mastectomy, following lumpectomy. Um, traditionally, this was sort of the only way to do reconstruction, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Um, and now that has very much changed. But there's still many, you know, many reasons why people may have delayed reconstruction for one reason or another. Uh, these are some that sort of came to mind as I was putting this talk together. Uh, prior ones being, you know, obviously breast cancer treatments. Uh, that always takes priority. Well, that'll be a recurring theme in this talk is that uh, what we do always works around uh, breast cancer care. Um, and so that is, uh, you know, one of the things that may lead to a delay in reconstruction. Um, any uncontrolled medical comorbidities, diabetes, people um, who have bad heart disease, things that may make them not the best operative candidates for surgery, where reconstruction, again, not being a medical necessity may sort of, uh, sort of take the back burner, so to speak. Uh, social factors, uh, things that may prevent people from, from that standpoint, or patient choice. I mean, that is always something there. Again, as I said, uh, reconstruction is not a medical necessity. And so uh, there's nothing to say that someone comes to see me and they have to do reconstruction. It is purely up to you. Um, our consultations, as with this talk, are purely for education and information for you to help make informed decisions. So, uh, one thing that often comes up right off the bat when we talk about uh, breast reconstruction and particularly after a mastectomy is what happens to the nipple. How does that work in terms of where we are currently with reconstruction? Um, and there really are two forms of mastectomies. Uh, there's ones that save the nipple and the ones that don't. Uh, the nipple sparing mastectomy really becomes sort of uh, very common now, relatively speaking. Uh, the decision to save or remove the nipple really is based on the location, the size of the tumor, as well as the breast anatomy. So it's a joint decision between your breast surgeon and myself or your plastic surgeon uh, to sort of figure out whether or not it makes sense uh, or whether it's safe uh, versus the traditional uh, or more traditional skin sparing mastectomy, where we try to preserve the majority of the breast skin uh, within options for nipple reconstruction down the road. Uh, breast reconstruction while following mastectomy, two primary options um, if it's done in an immediate fashion. Um, one is, or in a delayed fashion actually, um, one is uh, implant based, uh, and that is typically the traditional um, two stage tissue expander to implant reconstruction uh, versus an autologous based reconstruction, which is also coined uh, flap or using your own tissue to rebuild the breast. Um, and there are a variety of different flaps that are out there. We'll talk about some of that as we go along. Um, a lot of terminology used there. Uh, so those are kind of the two primary ways in general uh, that you can do reconstruction after a mastectomy. Uh, within implant reconstruction, then there kind of breaks down even further. There is one stage, you know, sort of going 
uh, quote unquote direct to implant, uh, where you put an implant in at the time of reconstruction and then you're done uh, in theory. Uh, the problem with that is that not everyone is a candidate. And oftentimes these people may still require or want to have additional revisional surgery, which then leads to you essentially having two surgeries uh, versus a traditional or more traditional two-stage uh, where you place that tissue expander as I mentioned before, uh, followed by exchange for an implant. Um, and that staging allows for, you know, control for the patient and for the surgeon as you progress with, again, at the size and shape that we want and be able to kind of get the symmetry the way we want it to. And it also keeps options open. When you have a tissue expander, you can really sort of then divert to whatever you want um, and uh, allows us also to have time for, uh, you know, any other adjuvant therapy you may need, such as radiation or chemotherapy. Implant reconstruction, you know, saline versus silicone. Um, you know, saline for at one point was all the rage because silicone was not on the market. Um, silicone implants have become much more uh, common and uh, are much safer now than they used to be. Uh, saline, you know, because of that, not as common. Um, really, again, late 90s, early 2000s, when they really sort of uh, catch, caught on and then they've kind of fallen out of favor again. Um, the nice thing is that they rupture, they flatten, so it's pretty obvious if they've ruptured, um, but they tend to just not look as good or just not as natural feeling. Uh, versus silicone, uh, much more natural feeling, and definitely are sort of the uh, the vast majority of the ones that we use. Uh, the technology is improved now with silicone gel instead of liquid, which makes them much safer uh, compared to the old implants you may have heard horror stories about, which when they broke, uh, you'd have liquid silicone kind of leak all over your body. Uh, then the other options then become, uh, which is sort of a more sort of a recent phenomenon, uh, is uh, where that implant goes. Does it go uh, below the muscle or above the muscle. Um, and so it's coined sort of uh, subpectral or prepectral reconstruction. Below is the most traditional and most common. Um, and that's where the expander implant is partly or fully covered by the pectoralis or big chest muscle that you use for push-ups uh, versus above the muscle, uh, becoming much more common, much more in vogue, um, has some advantages over uh, you know, going below the muscle. Um, and it requires though that the skin over top be extremely healthy as well as uh, a piece of mesh to help sort of support the expander and eventually implant so it doesn't move around too much. Autologous based reconstruction. Uh, so this is again, flap or using your own tissue. Uh, the most common being the abdominal domer site. Uh, the common terms here thrown around, tram flap, deep flap, SIE flap. Uh, these are the most common sort of forms all in the same spectrum of using your own tissue from your belly. Uh, here we're transferring fat, skin as needed, depending on how much skin needs to be replaced and blood vessels from the abdomen to the chest to help rebuild the breast. Um, and this is the most common form these days of uh, sort of autologous base reconstruction. Um, all the donor sites that are available, uh, the back, so-called latissimus muscle, um, this often requires a, uh, a tissue expander and also an implant to help kind of build the entire volume and shape of the breast. Um, inner thigh, buttocks, hips, all sort of secondary options compared to the abdomen. Uh, they tend to be a little bit higher risk in terms of the anatomy and the type of blood vessels, uh, a little bit more complex, frankly, just not as good, but available uh, depending on, you know, sort of patient to patient situation. Breast reconstruction volume lumpectomy, also an option. It also can be done sort of in an immediate or delayed fashion. Um, and the concepts here are really just around sort of replacing versus rearranging the breast tissue. When you talk about replacing, you do a lumpectomy, do you replace that volume with something? Um, using tissue for another part of the body, like again, latissimus muscle from the back or tissue from another site, um, or doing something called fat grafting, which we'll talk about later, which is basically transferring small amounts of fat from one area to another using liposuction. Uh, versus the other concept being rearrange, which is the most common way that we do things following lumpectomy, where we fill that lumpectomy defect by rearranging the remaining uh, breast tissue. Uh, and so overall the breast becomes smaller and this is what's coined an oncoplastic breast reduction. Um, and it has become again, you know, very in vogue these days, you know, amongst our patients. Um, so basically simultaneous surgery is done on the non-cancer breast that allows you to sort of achieve symmetry and sort of a breast lift or breast reduction at the same time as the lumpectomy. As I said, uh, breast cancer care always takes priority. Um, there's adjuvant therapies, um, sometimes new adjuvant done beforehand uh, that are used, chemotherapy, radiation, many of you may be familiar with these. Uh, before surgery uh, for chemotherapy, the timing of that uh, will then dictate the timing of surgery uh, as we want the chemotherapy to be finished and then there's a window we wanna get the surgery done in after that. Um, if chemotherapy is done after surgery, and then the timing of that will impact any additional surgery that needs to be done. For example, switching that tissue expander to an implant. Um, and generally, uh, chemotherapy doesn't have any long-term impacts on breast reconstruction. In contrast to that, 
uh, radiation therapy does have impacts. Um, and uh, if radiation is done prior to surgery, for example, someone who's had previous breast cancer care with a lumpectomy and now needs a mastectomy for recurrent cancer. Um, uh, those are people where we worry about radiation therapy. Um, and also if people need radiation after surgery um, and the timing of that radiation will impact the timing of any additional surgery as well. Um, and the issue with radiation, no matter when it's done before or afterwards is that it can generally increase your risk of complications. Uh, those include delayed wound healing, infection, and overall failure of that reconstruction, uh, which is why many people will hear sort of horror stories about the complications that can happen with breast reconstruction. Oftentimes, they can be related to radiation. Um, so we always take pause uh, when someone has had radiation or is going to need it in terms of kind of thinking about our options. So uh, that was breast reconstruction in a whirlwind, um, uh, kind of the typical information that's kind of given in one of our consults, but obviously in sort of less detail. Um, if there are questions about sort of that process, we can sort of address those as, as we move forward. Uh, but I really wanna kind of start focusing on sort of the three main sort of points uh, that this lecture was uh, designed for, which is looking at, um, you know, what happens next or what are your options um, if you don't do sort of, you know, sort of standard immediate breast reconstruction or what happens once you've had it. So let's first talk about delayed breast reconstruction. So again, delayed reconstruction after a previous mastectomy, uh, you're rebuilding the breast from scratch. So how do you do that? It's important to understand first sort of how is a breast made? What are the components of a breast? Um, and really the two things that you wanna look at or think about is the breast tissue um, or uh, you know, the volume of the breast and then the skin envelope, so to speak, which gives shape and structure to the breast, right? You can't have a breast without having the skin envelope on the outside as well as the tissue on the inside. And so, uh, in immediate reconstruction, as you can imagine, you know, we're able to replace the breast tissue with either an implant or a flap, as I mentioned before. Um, and we're able to save all, in the case of a nipple sparing, or most of, in the case of a skin sparing mastectomy, all of or most of that skin envelope, uh, because we are there right then when the breast tissue comes out, and we're able to replace things all at the same time. Um, in the delayed reconstruction, that's different because now what we have is we need to have replace your breast tissue, but we also need to recreate or replace the skin envelope, right? Because what happens is, is that during a mastectomy where no reconstruction is done, most of that skin is removed to be able to give a flat contour, makes it wear, easier to wear a prosthesis. It may make it easier for people to get their additional therapy, such as radiation if the chest is flat. Um, and so most of that skin is removed um, and that skin then scars down to the chest. Uh, which makes it e uh, harder to sort of uh, use that skin uh, in reconstruction. And that skin is necessary, as I mentioned earlier. You then talk about radiation, right? So uh, radiation therapy, although it's great for cancer, is not good for your own tissue. Um, and that leads to tightening of that remaining skin and that scar tissue. Uh, the skin is not as healthy or as elastic as non-radiated skin. Um, and so because of that, it makes it even that much more difficult to stretch out or use as part of a delayed reconstruction. So here you can see an example of a patient that saw me um, who had that exact situation. Uh, she had a, uh, you know, uh, a high grade cancer, uh, was not offered reconstruction, um, had a mastectomy, radiation, um, had her native breast on the other side, and she had a cosmetic augmentation on that side. And it come to me to talk about uh, what our options were in a delayed setting. So, um, so delayed reconstruction, what are your options from an implant standpoint? So uh, as you can imagine, uh, this almost always has to be two-stage. And the reason being is, as I said, um, you're lacking skin. And to be able to stretch that skin out, if there's even a chance to be able to do that, uh, you need that tissue expander to be able to do that initially. You can't, uh, in most cases, uh, you know, stretch that skin out with just an implant alone. Um, and so you need to kind of go through that two-stage process. The other thing is that because of that, it becomes more difficult to look natural, so to speak. Um, you know, an implant that's replacing sort of your native skin at the time of uh, mastectomy, the skin envelope is most of, if not the complete skin envelope. And so it's easy to kind of make that one for one switch. Once the skin is scarred down, you have to stretch it out. Uh, you may need to overstretch that skin. It may be harder to hide the contours of the implant. Um, and so you may need more sort of revisionary surgery to really achieve sort of the desired uh, sort of aesthetic result. Um, and the other issue is, as I mentioned before, when you've had radiation and that skin is so tight, um, it's not gonna stretch with that tissue expander no matter how hard we try. It's just not really an option. Um, so typically in someone who's had previous radiation like the previous patient I showed you, uh, an implant-based reconstruction in a delayed setting is not an option. 
So here's a patient that came to see me from uh, an outside hospital, moved to Chicago. Uh, this was a couple of years ago. She had not had radiation. Uh, she elected at the time not to have reconstruction, but um, uh, did not have any radiation. So had some, um, uh, you know, give to her skin, did have a little elasticity still there. Um, and was looking for sort of delayed, simple approach, uh, did not want to use her own tissue, nor did she have a lot of tissue there. Um, and uh, this is her result afterwards after using a tissue expander and implant. Uh, reasonable in a bra, she felt comfortable sort of with size and shape, uh, but outside of a bra, you can see, you can really see the contours of that implant. It's very hard to uh, hide that. Uh, we talked about additional things that we could do, uh, which she was not interested in at the time, um, but it would take additional work to really get that to look like her native breast. So again, delayed breast reconstruction, the loss of that skin is the problem, all right? That skin is scarred down. And so some newer techniques that we've developed recently um, or have been used more often is uh, are aimed at sort of preserving more of that skin in preparation for a delayed reconstruction. So if we know that someone is, uh, you know, wants to have reconstruction, but needs to be delayed due to medical reasons, maybe they have bad diabetes and we want to get that under control, um, or they need to have some sort of, um, you know, adjuvant therapy, radiation, whatever, chemotherapy, and we're worried about uh, the impact of reconstruction on that. And so we want to do the reconstruction later, um, but we know it's going to be coming. Then we try to do some things to help try to preserve that skin. Um, so it makes it easier to do the reconstruction in a delayed way. And so this is uh, something that's been coined the Goldilocks mastectomy. Uh, don't ask me why it was coined that, but that's sort of the name that's been given in the literature. Um, and so what we're doing here basically is, you know, after a mastectomy, uh, we're in an immediate setting at the same time as the mastectomy, uh, rearranging that remaining skin. So we preserve as much of it as possible uh, while also creating some sort of general kind of breast shape and structure. Um, in some patients where uh, they have very, very large breasts and they're not looking for a, fine, uh, a more definitive reconstruction, that can act as sort of the breast mound as in, in and of itself, you know, a smaller breast, but, you know, uh, is something there that can still act as a breast mound. Uh, but for many patients, this is sort of a way to stage things, get everything to kind of heal up. You have a shape and structure um, that uh, allows you to be set up for success down the road uh, to be able to do a reconstruction with a tissue expander, for example. So, so this is an example. Uh, here's the patient who had that exact procedure. Uh, she was here, uh, was not sure about reconstruction, um, really thought about sort of a Goldilocks as sort of her final product, and this is here what she had afterwards. Uh, but you can see here, these incisions that are here uh, allow us to kind of go back in here and put in a tissue expander after the fact that we wanted to. But at the same time, she also has, you know, a moderate, you know, a modest breast mount that she can also use as her, you know, own breasts and, and leave it at that. And that's what she chose to do. Uh, but we've had other patients that use this technique then to get through whatever they need to get through uh, and then come back and get reconstruction after the fact. So. So this is sort of, you know, kind of uh, a newer sort of uh, technique that is being employed, uh, not just here, but across the country. So autologous based reconstruction in a delayed setting. Uh, this is probably the most common form. And you can imagine, again, it allows us now to both replace that breast tissue, but also replace that breast skin that is scarred down, you know, replace that skin envelope simultaneously. And again, this is the best option. If someone's had radiation where we can't expand that skin, um, you can then just bring someone's skin from another part of their body uh, to replace that instead. So this is typically the best option in some shape or form. Most common, uh, again, it's gonna be the abdominal donor sites, the TRAM, deep SIA plasma I mentioned to you. Um, really the candidacy or you know, someone being a candidate for this depends on how much skin and fat they have available, right? Um, as you can imagine, if you need to rebuild that skin envelope, then you not just need the, the fat for the belly, which in an immediate setting, a lot of times we cut that skin off and just sort of replace fat for fat. Um, now we need that skin to rebuild that skin envelope. So you need to have enough skin to be able to transfer over to be able to create a breast shape as well. Um, other options, you know, again, the most common being the latissimus from the back. Uh, this becomes an option because you get skin as fat as well. But as you can imagine, the amount of skin that you can pinch from your back is gonna be less than what you can pinch from your stomach typically. Um, and so that's normally not enough to be able to recreate the breast in and of itself. We oftentimes will place a tissue expander there and then stretch things out. But now you're stretching out sort of new skin from the back as opposed to stretching out uh, skin that's been radiated, for example, on the chest. So um, uh, a little bit more feasible. Um, again, not as good as the abdominal donor sites, uh, but definitely still an option um, and a very common one that's used. So here's a patient that saw me uh, actually when she first had breast cancer before her mastectomies, 
was not sure about reconstruction um, and uh, decided against it. She said she wasn't ready for it. She wanted to move forward and decided not to have it, which is fine. Of course, as we said, it's always a patient choice. Uh, she came back a year later uh, after being fully healed from her mastectomy. As you can see here, she's completely flat, long scars across her chest. Um, and she was second guessing that decision and wanted to go back and do reconstruction in a delayed manner. And so after a couple surgeries, you know, uh, using her belly tissue, uh, to recreate uh, deep flaps here, uh, some revision, and then a nipple reconstruction. Uh, this is where she is now. So again, she's limited by how much she has in her belly. We needed to use all the skin from here to be able to recreate the breast mound here. Um, she has a reasonable result. She's very happy with it. Um, but again, it is more challenging. It is definitely more difficult to do it in a delayed way, though it can always be done. Um, you just have to kind of work through with the options there. So that's sort of delayed breast reconstruction in a nutshell. And again, for each of these sections, you know, please just let me know if you have questions at the end. Uh, we can address anything and everything um, once we're done. Uh, so we'll move on to um, uh, breast reconstruction uh, maintenance. So what does this mean? Because this is sort of can be a confusing topic. So breast cancer care and breast reconstruction are a process. Um, and if you've spoken to any plastic surgeon about this or any breast surgeon, they will tell you that. Um, because it can typically require multiple stages, as I outlined in that first uh, part of the talk. Uh, these occur over time, obviously. And part of that process, not everybody highlights, is sort of the maintenance of that reconstruction. You know, this is part of your body as you move along and move away from your breast cancer um, and live, hopefully, a nice, healthy life moving forward. Uh, it's something that you need to kind of be thinking about in the background. So what does maintenance mean? Well, I'm using the term maintenance loosely. Uh, you know, breast cancer, breast reconstruction, as I said, has lifelong impact, and the reasons for this quote-unquote maintenance can vary. Uh, one is that uh, there is a need, obviously, for breast cancer monitoring. That is maintenance to some degree, and this is the case with any patient with previous breast cancer. You want to be able to sort of monitor for any sign of recurrence, even if you've had a double mastectomy, but particularly if you've had a lumpectomy, you obviously still have breast tissue there uh, to be able to kind of keep an eye on. So that's sort of one piece of maintenance that outside of my realm, but still relevant to what I see in that uh, other things that come up when it comes to maintenance have to do with the reconstruction itself, right? Addressing problems with that reconstruction. Uh, there are typically kind of two categories to this. Um, one is, are there problems that are medical necessity? Um, is someone having pain? Are they having discomfort? Um, or is there something related to a rec recurrent breast cancer that we need to address because now that's gonna have to uh, impact you know, the reconstruction that they had? Um, or are there concerns related to their implants? It's a very common question that people have about maintenance. We're gonna address those here in a minute. Um, but are we having a problem with your implant? Uh, and is there a medical problem or medical necessity to that that we need to do something about it? Uh, the other common reason uh, that people address, uh, you know, sort of maintenance issues of the reconstruction is uh, sort of more sort of quote unquote cosmetic, uh, the appearance of it, the symmetry, the way everything feels, um, sort of getting things to be sort of uh, satisfactory for them to be able to kind of live the life the way they want to, um, instead of addressing those concerns. So those are kind of the two main reasons people sort of have kind of maintenance or sort of think about sort of um, maintaining or uh, addressing sort of issues with the reconstruction. Um, and so, you know, I bring this up because again, this is not something that's always well understood. There's several myths and misconceptions I feel like, because uh, I hear a lot of patients asking about these things. So we'll try to clear some of that up today uh, about, you know, what does that mean to have maintenance of your breast reconstruction? Like what, what do you have to do? What, what is required, et cetera? Um, and it's important to understand that I try to highlight this for patients when I first meet them, um, because uh, this can impact your decisions for your initial reconstruction if you know sort of what's coming down the road. Um, so we try to make sure that people are aware of uh, what you may, you know, what you should expect uh, once you have that type of whatever reconstruction you choose. Um, and maintenance can then lead to revisionary surgery. That'll be the last part of the talk uh, where we talk about um, if you have an issue that needs to be addressed, then you may need a revision to address that. So uh, first let's talk about after a lumpectomy. So after a lumpectomy, um, typically this is a consideration um, in terms of maintenance if you've had no simultaneous reconstruction. If you just had a lumpectomy, you never saw a plastic surgeon and, or did an aquaplastic reduction or did nothing to address the, the sort of defect or sort of uh, lack of volume that's there when that tissue gets taken out, um, then there may be issues with breast appearance and symmetry, all right? The lumpectomy removes tissue from one breast and not from the other. Because of that, of course, then you have a scar, you have differences in breast volume, and that can lead to things that may require quote unquote maintenance. And what I mean by that is, 
Um, as many people know, when you have a lump acne, oftentimes you need radiation. Um, and when that happens, um, as we mentioned before, there's tightening of the remaining breast tissue. Uh, you can get indentation tightening in particular at the side of the lumpectomy scar, uh, where that scar becomes firm and dented, just does not look uh, aesthetically pleasing. Um, and as the breasts age, these differences can become accentuated, right? These differences become more obvious over time because a non-radiated breast ages, quote unquote, very differently than a radiated breast does. Again, a radiated breast stays tight uh, and firm. A non-radiated breast is going to have some of the, you know, um, sort of uh, additional sort of drooping and sagging or growth uh, that can happen to many breasts as they age to many women. Um, and so those differences uh, become much more apparent um, as women age over time. So just to show an example of that, um, here's a patient that saw me um, in her uh, early 70s that had uh, lumpectomies twice on the left side um, 15, 20 years ago. And so she was living her life uh, in this state uh, with one breast being significantly larger, almost uh, double, if not double the size of the other side. Uh, she complained of back pain um, and pulling and tightness on the right side compared to the left. Uh, she really was sort of a, a tough spot in terms of how she felt in her comfort level. And this was because she said that at the time uh, she was much more symmetric, but as she's aged since her lumpectomies, um, her right breast has become dramatically larger and, and more, uh, the technical term being totic or drooping or sagging uh, compared to the left side, because the left side was not going to do that being the radiated breast. So we'll show uh, photos later of sort of what we did for her to get her to be in a better place. Here's another example of a patient, uh, similar concept, lumpectomy not as far out uh, on the right side. You can see the scar across the nipple there and, and an indentation that breast is firmer, tighter, lifted a little bit higher than the left breast. And in a similar way here, another patient, left breast lumpectomy, radiation, indented scar. Um, these are tough problems to fix, uh, which we'll talk about. Um, but uh, this is the thing that happens is that as the breasts age, as they move along, there are differences in volume and symmetry and how things um, move forward with years. So uh, let's talk about maintenance. Uh, so we'll talk about sort of what do we do for those people, sort of the revisionary part of it. I want to just highlight kind of the things that people think about uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, reconstruction and, and uh, and maintenance and so forth. And then we'll talk about the revisionary aspect in the next segment here. Um, so let's talk about sort of maintenance after uh, mastectomy and reconstruction. Again, implant-based, autologous-based. The words that I say for any of my patients that are on the call here, uh, you've heard these words, implant reconstruction, it's easy up front. There is long-term maintenance. Autologous reconstruction, using your own tissue, harder up front, but there are long-term benefits in that, you know, in regards to maintenance. Uh, and so that's what we'll kind of highlight here in this part of the talk, uh, which is that as everyone sort of hears about these sort of stories and myths that I feel like people hear about the most is um, maintenance related to implants, all right? Uh, Implant-based reconstruction has uh, become notorious for this. And I try to break it down when I talk to patients in sort of two different categories. Um, maintenance for implants really has to do with the shelf life of the implant, and then also how your body ages uh, around your implant, quote unquote. Um, in general, uh, there are general guidelines that uh, if you have an implant reconstruction that you should have your implant checked or looked at every couple of years uh, by your surgeon or by somebody uh, just to make sure that there are no issues uh, surrounding to the things I mentioned above, uh, but we'll talk about more in detail sort of what those things mean. So what do I mean by implant shelf life? Uh, so for the FDA, uh, implants have an expiration date, quote unquote, uh, that they last 10 years. Now in reality, uh, most likely you're not going to have any problems uh, for much longer than that. Uh, the new implants in particular are very, very durable. Um, and so we think they're going to last, you know, without a problem, uh, 15, 20, 30 years. Um, but the FDA does have to set expiration date to them. Um, as I tell my patients, it doesn't mean that a buzzer is going to go off for 10 years and says, uh, time to change your implants. That's not how it works. Um, you just uh, want to be sort of cognizant of the fact that there may be slightly increased risk um, of uh, the implant breaking. And that's their concern. Um, is that there's a slight increased chance over time once you get past 10 years, uh, but that there's no set recommendation. This comes up a lot. Um, there is no set recommendation that you have to replace your implants every 10 years. Uh, just because you hit that 10 year mark, nothing changes. Uh, you just want to be aware and continue to have surveillance uh, to make sure that your implants are not having a problem. But it doesn't mean just because it's 10 years out that you need to go and have surgery. So with regards to that shelf life and if they were to break, the good thing to know um, is that, as we mentioned before, silicone implants and new ones are made of this cohesive silicone gel. There is no liquid silicone in these implants. 
uh, and this is unlike the older generation of implants uh, that had liquid silicone back in the 70s and 90s, where if those implants broke, uh, liquid silicone would sort of leach and leak all over your body, and it became a big to-do, uh, to the point that those implants were taken off the market and there's a moratorium uh, because of all the problems that they were causing. Um, now with these new implants, uh, if the implant breaks, nothing leaks, nothing goes anywhere. In fact, I always demonstrate to patients that uh, with these implants, I can slice that implant in half and it just sits there like a gummy bear, like the gummy bear candy. That's why they're called gummy implants. Because uh, you slice that implant in half and the silicone just sits there, nothing leaks out anywhere. And all your body does is just react by making some scar tissue around it. And so again, it makes those uh, scar tissue around you get this sort of mild tightening of this early what's called capsular contracture, which is a term may, many of you may be familiar with. Um, but this is something that is not unsafe. Uh, and the treatment is pretty straightforward. You replace the implant, obviously, you remove or replace the capsule uh, that's formed around the implant, um, but it's not something that is life-threatening or dangerous uh, or harmful to you in any particular way, uh, but it may cause symptoms. It may cause some pain, it may have some tightness feeling, uh, some, some distortion of how the breast looks, uh, which will trigger the fact um, that uh, you, there may be a problem with your implant if you have those symptoms, uh, which leads to the second set of misconceptions I always hear about is, uh, do I need to have MRIs? Do I need to have uh, imaging of my implant every couple of years? Um, no one really does that. You only see that in the FDA guidelines, uh, but there's the very few plastic surgeons that actually do that on a regular basis because it's a lot of wasted expense. Uh, because in reality, if there's a problem with your implant, particularly since you're so safe now, um, you're going to know there's a problem. And if you have a problem, then you just go see your plastic surgeon. Um, and they'll be able to tell you and figure that out and get an MRI at that point if there's a concern. Um, but again, no one really recommends, at least on the plastic surgery side of things, uh, getting routine MRIs uh, for surveillance, mainly just sort of checking in with your surgeon every couple of years. So that's the first piece of maintenance when it comes to implants that people come out talk about a lot of sort of, again, shelf life uh, of those implants if your implant breaks. Uh, the more common thing that I, I see um, has to do with uh, maintenance regarding how your body changes over time, right? Because uh, it's an unfortunate reality, as all of us know, um, that uh, our bodies change uh, as we age. Uh, we get weight changes, our skin stretches or sags, things happen. You know, the quote that we always throw around is gravity always wins, right? Things with gravity is going to want to sort of pull things down on your body, um, and that's going to happen, including your implants. Um, but as your body changes, it's gonna be changing around your implant, all right? Uh, your implant is your implant is your implant. It's not gonna change in terms of size and shape, um, unless we're to break, obviously. Um, and so uh, with that change, you get a change in the way the implants look, relatively speaking. You know, they may not look the way they did when your surgeon finished uh, with your reconstructive process, uh, you know, however many years before. Um, and so this is probably the most common reason why I see people come back for sort of um, more kind of uh, appearance or sort of cosmetic quote unquote maintenance. Um, implants can change position or appearance, as I said. Uh, they can uh, commonly sort of drop or move towards the sides. That's with gravity, because uh, as we sleep, uh, gravity sort of pulls them down to the sides. Uh, when we're standing up, they drop towards the bottom. Um, if you have an implant on one side and you have your native breast on the other side, you can imagine that they already start out looking a little bit different. They will age differently, right? Your native breast, again, is going to age differently uh, than your implant does. Um, and that is something that not everybody sort of recognizes when they first start out. Um, and in general, you know, I highlight all of this because again, changes in implants, um, this is the norm, not the exception. Um, changes are not a threat to your health. This is just sort of, you know, natural aging, uh, but sort of natural within sort of aging around unnatural or sort of, you know, prosthetic implants. Um, they impact the aesthetics of your outcome, right? Which can then be addressed with a revisional surgery. So, you know, again, implant rupture is not very common, which is why we don't see lots of that with regards to sort of maintenance and revisional surgery. Uh, we do see some for sure, um, but more commonly we see people coming in unsatisfied with their reconstruction for some reason or something has changed um, and they want to address that uh, with the next part of the talk, which is sort of a revision of some sort. So briefly, uh, autologous-based reconstruction. Uh, here's where that long-term benefit comes in, right? Like I said, uh, harder upfront, long-term benefits. There generally is no long-term maintenance with this form of reconstruction. Now, there's a caveat to that, which I'll highlight. Um, but uh, in general, most women who undergo sort of that bigger surgery, that deep flap or that uh, tram flap, SA, you know, latissimus flap, whatever it is, those people can go undergo, you know, maybe one more sort of revisional surgery uh, after they're healed from the initial procedure. Um, and this is typically shorter, easy surgery, um, you know, than the initial reconstruction. Um, and, you know, typically the idea is that, you know, if I already gone this far and gone through this big surgery, um, why not do one more quick 
easy things just to kind of get things to look better. Uh, and the goal of that surgery really is multiple fold, uh, depending on patient to patient, um, improving the contour shape of the breast, uh, correcting any symmetries, uh, improving the appearance of scars, small things, you know, sort of, you know, quote unquote, nip tuck type of surgery, you gotta get things looking as good as we can. Uh, the harder part being obviously the initial reconstruction where we're transferring that tissue. But then once you've had that, even before that, I mean, no one has to have even that first revisional surgery. Um, there is no requirement moving forward for additional maintenance. Uh, there is no tissue expander we need to move, take out and replace. There is no implant we need to check on. It is, it is you, it is your tissue. And, and so that is that long-term benefit is that tissue will age with you over time. There's nothing to check on or monitor. Um, you know, now obviously with a latissimus flap, a little bit different because there is an implant. So that's sort of a hybrid type of reconstruction. Uh, but with a true abdominal donor site flap, uh, nothing to check on or check on or monitor, sorry. Um, but the one thing I think people don't necessarily realize, which I try to sort of point out to people, um, is that that tissue is subject to sort of natural changes that occur with aging, right? That is going to look and feel more like a natural breast, uh, which to many women is appealing. That is the good thing. Um, but at the same time, is then subject to sort of how natural breasts age. Um, and so this may lead to some patients, and we've had some come now, um, who are a few years out from that surgery, who again have lost weight, gained weight, whatever it is, um, and are looking to improve the aesthetics or cosmesis of their reconstruction uh, with revisional surgery, even though uh, there was no requirement to do so. It's just that the breast have aged in such a way that they uh, want to do that for their own uh, set of benefit. Um, so just something to kind of keep in mind is that these will age just like the rest of your body. So breast reconstruction maintenance. So uh, we talked about sort of the sort of introductions of this segment of the talk, which is sort of the last segment of the talk, uh, which is revisional surgery. So you go through reconstruction, whether it's immediate, delayed, you're checking on things, you're watching things, and for some reason or another, um, you get to the point where another surgery either is indicated, needed, or something that you want to move forward with. Um, so that's this last part we'll sort of highlight is revisional uh, set of approaches and things that we do uh, for different types of patients. Again, I can't say it enough, reconstruction is a process. Uh, it requires multiple stages. Um, and although reconstruction is considered complete um, after that initial flap surgery or that tissue expander and implant, there may be indications for additional surgery in the future. The important thing to note right off the bat, because this is a very common question that we get, um, is that breast reconstruction, although not medically necessary, is covered by insurance. Um, there's the Women's Health Cancer Rights Act, which is the federal act in 1998 that mandates insurance coverage for all stages of reconstruction, surgery on your native breast to achieve symmetry as needed, external prostheses, treatment of all complications, of mastectomy, et cetera. This includes breast reconstruction revision. So anybody who needs down the road, at least at this point in time, and I don't see this changing many times soon, um, anybody who's looking to have revisional surgery, even if it's for sort of improving sort of the feel or appearance or symmetry, uh, that should be covered by insurance once you've sort of uh, entered sort of the breast cancer umbrella or even the elevated breast cancer umbrella if you were sort of an increased risk and had a prophylactic mastectomy. Um, so insurance should cover anything that we're talking about here. Breast reconstruction revision, it really is unique to each patient. You know, it is not one size fits all. Clearly, it is based on sort of what brings you in to want that revision. Um, and so the options are really tailored to whatever we're trying to achieve and what the desired outcome is. Um, and, you know, we'll highlight sort of different common things that I see. But at the end of the day, just know that this is not a, uh, uh, you know, an exhaustive list of all the things that can or maybe suggested to you or maybe talked about or done. Um, but it's important to know that, you know, you want to have realistic expectations. Uh, we often see not only our own patients, but, you know, just as often, if not more often, uh, patients from other institutions, patients that have seen other surgeons. Um, and I'm sure this happens with my own patients and my partner's patients, but we all, you know, patients go and get second opinions and see other people and that's encouraged. And so we'll often see patients that um, have uh, had surgery elsewhere. Um, are not satisfied for one reason or another and want to know about what the options are to improve things or fix things. Um, and so it's important to know that uh, expectations we try to set early on um, because the outcome of that revision is even limited based on sort of where we're starting. You know, depending on kind of what sort of outcome you've had initially will determine sort of how far we can take it and how much better we can make things uh, moving forward. Uh, and then there are also, again, you know, uh, as I've highlighted before, limitations if someone's had previous radiation. If you've had radiation before, 
less that we can do to manipulate and make that tissue um, or that implant or whatever it is uh, look and feel better. So revisions after lumpectomy, going back to sort of those patients I showed earlier. Um, as I said, impacted by the need for radiation after lumpectomy, tightening of that scar, tightening of that tissue, uh, the breasts are gonna age differently. So how do we address that um, if you have those issues? So one common technique, fat grafting. I mentioned this earlier. So to highlight that a little bit more in detail, uh, fat grafting really is used to correct contour differences uh, in breast shape. Uh, it's often used to fill indented scars following a lumpectomy um, or during a scar revision, or when we, we'll talk about this when we talk about implants uh, and, and flaps, again, to contour sort of the breast shape overall. So again, we extract through liposuction, um, sort of process that sort of in the operating room right then and there, and then re-inject that tissue uh, or those fat cells uh, into the breast itself. Um, no real uh, major risk that's been studied, no increased risk of breast cancer related to these. It can cause um, some changes on a mammogram. Uh, so for people who have a lumpectomy, it's important for people to know that, and that can be sort of seen as uh, sort of changes in the mammogram that may need to be sort of addressed um, instead of, you know, sort of double checked on or biopsied. Um, but uh, in general, very well tolerated and easy to do. Uh, after lumpectomy, less common, but can be used, um, you know, using a flap, you know, replacing tissue, as I mentioned before, uh, that's been removed. Um, and this can be used to improve differences in volume between breasts. You know, breasts, uh, one breast is smaller compared to the other, trying to sort of reachieve that size and shape. Um, and this can be used using tissue, again, from the back, chest, other part of the body. Latissimus flap is a common option, using sort of small areas of skin or uh, fat from sort of lower part of the uh, or upper part of the abdomen or lower part of the breast. Um, you know, there are a variety of different options that are there. Um, this is typically reserved for larger lumpectomies where there's really a big asymmetry between the two sides. Um, and it often removes sort of, you know, includes removing that existing lumpectomy scar or at least revising it. So it is a little bit more extensive for sure. Um, and uh, really is reserved for people who are really looking to um, uh, make a large improvement in sort of the breast shape compared to the other side. Uh, other common techniques that are used, surgery on the non-cancer breast, right? Surgery to accommodate for the fact that the breasts have aged differently, right? So again, the radiated breast aging differently than the non-radiated breast. What can we do to sort of even things out, so to speak, uh, without necessarily not, you know, operating on the radiated side or sort of doing minimal there, but mainly doing stuff to the non-radiated side. So common things to do there, you saw those photos of people who have that tightening or lifting of the breast on one side because of the radiation, you lift or uh, reduce the size of the non-cancer breast to try to match things at least in a bra clothing. So examples of that, here's that patient I showed you earlier. Uh, again, given her back pain and the asymmetry she was having, we did a breast reduction on the one side. Uh, not perfect by any means, but it's dramatically better compared to where she was. And she's over the moon with how she's feeling now uh, compared to how she's been dealing with this for the past 20 years. Um, so again, a very common option that we use uh, for trying to get people to be in a better place in terms of symmetry. So another patient, uh, she had a uh, lumpectomy on the left side. As you can see her scar here around the nipple, a little bit of tightening on the side compared to the other side, wanted to have this side lifted up along with doing uh, fat grafting on this side to help improve the volume here. And so we lifted this side, uh, put some more fat into this breast, and now she's much more even, uh, is happy with sort of the size and shape. Um, and again, uh, an outpatient, uh, easy, uh, relatively speaking, sort of recovery procedure. One more patient here. Uh, this is only a couple of weeks out from surgery. Same concept. Uh, scar here. We did a little bit of fat crafting, tried to revise that scar to give it a little bit better shape, and then lifting the side. The most important thing just to try to even things out. So if she's in a bra or in a clothes, she's not sort of feeling lopsided, so to speak. So revision after implant-based reconstruction, even more involved in terms of the options that are available to you. Uh, and partly because a lot of things can happen after implants, as we mentioned. Uh, revisional surgery, uh, you know, addressing the issues that we see during implant maintenance, implant rupture, you know, an unacceptable appearance of the implant or outcome of how things look, uh, or again, that changing of your body over time around the implant. So a variety of techniques. I'm just going to kind of breeze through these quickly. Uh, tightening of the breast implant or capsule um, or the skin around the implant. Uh, this may require some additional or new scars to help kind of do that. Uh, common reason to use this type of approach, uh, very commonly seen, implants that have moved, shifted, are not positioned well, um, have changed over time in terms of where they sit. Uh, asymmetry, one that has changed differently than the other, um, or one that has changed relative to a native breast that has uh, aged differently. 
Um, you can sometimes use this to prevent flipping implants. Sometimes people have implants that flip back and forth uh, that can be uh, irritating or a nuisance when they're active. Um, and uh, we may tighten up the sort of space the implant is sitting in to prevent it from doing that. We may also make changes to the type of implant in that scenario. Um, and then implant rippling, you know, a common thing that people see is the ripples in the implant shell uh, that may kind of show through their skin. So tightening up the uh, skin may be one way to kind of help remedy that. Another option, as I mentioned before, fat grafting, uh, used to make subtle improvements in the contour around an implant. Uh, most common areas to do this in, uh, and I often will do this at the time we actually take out your expander or put your implant in, we often will do fat grafting at that time to help avoid these problems. Uh, but it improves sort of the shelf-like appearance that implants can have where you sort of have uh, the contour of the chest and all of a sudden you have sort of a step off and you get right to the implant. This helps sort of smooth that out to make it look more natural. Uh, and you can also use it to sort of improve any other sort of indentations or, you know, uh, areas that are not sort of a nice contour anywhere along uh, the implant itself. Um, and it can also use, uh, be used to help kind of thicken anybody who has sort of thin breast skin. Uh, again, that may help improve rippling to help kind of shield or uh, hide sort of the contours of the implant. Exchanging the implant, uh, obviously a very common thing that we do. Uh, common reasons to use this, for a variety of reasons, it's just a short list. Uh, you know, change in the desired size. May, so many women may come in and, you know, as their body is changed, they want to either go up or down in size. And the uh, and that may also require sort of rising or tightening up or loosening up uh, the implant capsule or skin. Um, if an implant is ruptured, obviously, as we talked about, removing and replacing that and, um, you know, removing the capsule is needed. Um, and then again, uh, dealing with rippling, uh, sometimes increasing that implant size to better fill out the space that it's in can help to eliminate the, uh, the problem of uh, rippling that people may see. So some examples here. Uh, this is a patient came from an outside institution. Uh, she had reconstruction uh, 20, 25 years ago. I uh, had a very old implant ruptured on this left side. Pain called capsular contracture, tightening as the implant is kind of shifted up towards her, uh, her shoulder here. Uh, quite uncomfortable. Uh, and so we went back, uh, put in new implants uh, that are helping last her for the rest of her life um, and repositioned them to have a sort of better shape and contour. And, uh, and since then, she's had actually a nipple reconstruction as well. Uh, but again, coming from the outside, someone has sort of been dealing with this for a while and finally decided to sort of, you know, address it now that she was having symptoms. Uh, another patient, uh, this also someone who came from the outside, uh, reconstruction previously on the right side, nothing on the left. Um, her implant, I believe, was a saline implant uh, that completely deflated because her skin had sort of shrunk down. We had to sort of start from scratch. Um, and so started with a tissue expander, uh, eventually placed an implant, did a lift of the breast on the other side. Again, not perfect by any means, but improved in terms of shape and position uh, where she's very happy and comfortable in a bra. Um, this is one of my own patients, uh, had a reconstruction with a tissue expander and an implant. Um, and this is someone just to highlight the sort of power of fat grafting. Uh, you can see her here. Uh, this was her after initial implant exchange. Uh, we didn't do any fat grafting then, uh, but she wasn't necessarily happy with sort of the contour of the breast. And I'll show you this from a side view in a second. We did some fat grafting, able to get sort of increased uh, fullness in the upper part of the breast um, and around the edges. And you can see that here on the side. You can see here she had more of an indentation, sort of more of this kind of step off. Uh, on both, and now that's kind of a nice sort of smooth contour on both sides, uh, sort of much more sort of natural appearing uh, as opposed to you know, before the fat grafting was done. Uh, another patient, uh, this is one of mine as well, uh, tissue expander implant. Uh, implants have sort of dropped. You can see here that her skin is sort of stretched out a little bit, and so the implants have kind of come down. This one's sitting lower than this one. She was just sort of uncomfortable in a bra and wanted to sort of position things a little bit better. So we tighten both sides up much better in terms of symmetry. She's much more comfortable. She can go without a bra um, and, and feel that she's not uh, lopsided. Um, so again, here, tightening the skin, tightening the implant capsule on the inside, uh, giving those implants less space to, room, to, to move around. So again, reconstruction after uh, using a flap. We talked about, again, no long-term maintenance. Uh, but we talked about this sort of revisionary surgery that people do undergo, sort of shorter surgeries to improve contour and asymmetry. So we'll talk about what we do there. Uh, common techniques we use there in that sort of revisional surgery. Fat grafting, again, you can make larger improvements in these cases because um, unlike an implant where you are limited, then you can't obviously put fat into the implant. Um, here, we're putting fat into your own tissue. And so you really can put a fair amount in there to improve contour, improve shape and size. Um, and so fat grafting is going to be pretty powerful. Uh, in these patients. Uh, revising the scars of the breast, 
Um, a common thing that we uh, will do, which I'll show you some examples here in a moment, um, is, uh, you know, the first surgery being, again, the goal being to reconstruct the breast, but also to have healthy tissue to make sure that we go through this long, arduous surgery uh, and that we have a good result that survives and heals well. Um, and then in the second surgery, getting the aesthetics and the cosmesis just right, lifting, reducing, tightening, uh, improving symmetry, et cetera. In certain cases, even placing an implant behind the uh, tissue and for people who are looking for sort of a, a more augmented appearance. Uh, and then oftentimes, if it's the abdominal donor site, uh, revising that abdominal scar, revising the contour there uh, to get a better result overall. So just some patient examples. Uh, here's a patient who had a deep flap uh, uh, from her abdomen. You can see her scar here. Common thing that we see, so-called affectionately dog ears, these little bumps at the end of the uh, scars uh, that sort of get caught in her pants. Um, she was looking for a little bit more lift, a little bit uh, sort of uh, of a more projected look to the breast as well as sort of making these uh, skin paddles, which came uh, to replace her nipples from the belly to make those smaller. So we lifted and tightened the breast with a reduction here. Uh, this was actually this little indentation from her uh, daughter running into her and <laughs> creating a little uh, scar there, unfortunately, uh, soon after surgery. So we corrected that afterwards. But again, otherwise, uh, much improved appearance, good symmetry. You can't see the scar here, but, uh, you know, improved both this indented area as well as kind of flatten up the contour on the sides. Another example. A uh, patient who had a, uh, a previous radiation on the right side, uh, had reconstruction with a tissue expander initially, and before she got infected, I had to have that removed, and then she was flat on this side. So we did a delayed reconstruction with a flap uh, on this side, uh, as well as uh, a, flap on this, um, a flap on this side as well. And this is what she was left with uh, to even things out, lifted up this flap, uh, even things out here, much better symmetry than she was previously. Another example, one side of reconstruction this time, uh, this is her native breast, this is the side that had a flap, again, goal being get healthy tissue up there, and then we can fix the rest. Uh, did a lift and tightening of this side, a little bit of reduction on this side as well, uh, and now much more even and symmetric, and she's since had a nipple reconstruction as well. Another example here, a uh, patient who had a very large breast, um, reduced the size of them, did deep flaps from the belly, um, and at the end of all that, still had sort of an asymmetry with a larger breast here versus here, um, sort of reduced the size of this with liposuction and taking some tissue out, uh, revised some of the scars here, much more even appearance and how she feels in, um, in her abdomen, or in her chest, sorry. And then with her abdomen, uh, you can see here, she still had sort of a sort of pooched out appearance of her belly, so kind of tightening up the skin here and on the sides uh, to give her sort of a better appearance to her scar. Another example, uh, here's somebody who uh, was not happy with sort of the size of the uh, flaps and actually we put implants in behind to help give a more sort of projected look to it. So you can see here, she's much more filled out. We also contoured the sides of the scars uh, to take out sort of these, uh, again, these dog ears that uh, people can often get as well as kind of flattening out this part of the scar. So again, all of these in sort of uh, revisional surgeries that again, generally are uh, outpatient, couple hours um, easier than the original kind of flap surgery. So I'm gonna pause here for a second because that was a lot, a lot of information there. Um, and, um, you know, as I said, breast reconstruction, there's a lot to talk about. Um, and as I've highlighted many times in this talk, in conclusion, um, there's a lot to talk about because breast reconstruction is a process. Uh, there are almost always options at any point during this process, uh, during breast cancer care, uh, in a delayed fashion, in an immediate fashion, uh, in a revisionary fashion, there is typically always things that can be done. It's just a matter of sort of figuring out what the priorities are um, and um, what, uh, you know, what your options are when you speak with your plastic surgeon. Um, previous breast reconstruction, you know, may require maintenance to different degrees, as we've highlighted. Um, and uh, in that regard, as you go through that process, uh, this can lead to uh, revisional surgery, particularly unsatisfactory breast reconstruction, uh, which can be approved with this. Um, and so those are kind of the things that, again, I wanted to highlight um, because uh, in reality, I feel like these are things that are not talked about as much as they should be. Um, and so we all can sort of strive as plastic surgeons to uh, better highlight these things for patients like yourself. So with that, uh, I think we'll stop for questions. Uh, I know Savina, you had, uh, sent in a couple for patients, so I can start with those um, and just sort of address those and then um, I'll let Sabina kind of lead the uh, sort of question answers um, sort of part of the presentation. Um, I'll jump to these two questions that were sent in before uh, the talk today. 
Um, and again, these may be more patient specific, but um, some things may be applied to people on this call. Um, you know, first question was sent in, uh, does reconstruction make it more difficult to detect a recurrence on your breast? Um, that's a great question. Again, one of those sort of common sort of myth misconceptions. Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, there are many studies uh, to show that one uh, reconstruction, excuse me, does, uh, uh, does not impact your chance of recurrence and in general does not impact your ability to uh, be able to detect recurrence or have surveillance. Now that being said, uh, surveillance is very important, not just from a uh, maintenance of your reconstruction standpoint, but with your oncology team, uh, with your medical oncologist, with your breast surgeon, et cetera. Um, to be looking for, for example, after a lumpectomy, obviously recurrence on a mammogram, or after a mastectomy, recurrence on visual exam of lumps and bumps. As I mentioned at one point in the talk, uh, there have been you know, a handful of times where someone's had a reconstruction, and then something came back as a recurrence, and we had to work with the breast surgeon uh, to not only uh, remove that occurrence and get their therapy, but also revise their reconstruction at the same time. Um, so, but in general, uh, having reconstruction does not uh, limit that ability. Uh, but at the same time, we always work with the oncologist to make sure that someone is a good candidate for it. If there's a question or a concern, uh, then obviously breast cancer care always takes priority. And then one other question that came up, again, uh, more patient specific. Uh, if my breast has been radiated twice, do you normally recommend a flap surgery if not enough skin on stomach? And what is recovery like this for kind of flap and any surgery risks? Uh, fairly broad question, but just in general, as I highlighted before, if you've had radiation, particularly twice, uh, definitely an implant is not gonna be a, an option for you, most likely, um, and a flap of some sort is gonna be uh, recommended. Um, if the abdomen is not something that has enough tissue to be able to use and do that for, then there are other options that are out there. Um, and the risk for those are, you know, uh, probably more than uh, we probably need to talk about in this form, um, but something that we can talk about offline um, or, you know, obviously in a formal consultation if that person is here on this call or wants to, uh, to reach out. So. so with that, I will leave this up as my contact information. Uh, I want to thank everybody and uh, the Cancer Wellness Center and Sabina for, for giving me the opportunity to speak and, the, and, and hosting this tonight. Um, and to all of you for attending. Um, again, it's, uh, it's always odd doing this over Zoom. I feel like I'm just talking to myself, but um, hopefully we'll have a little bit of interaction here at the end for uh, any questions you may have. So I will stop there and uh, open things up. Um, so Dr. Seth, uh, before I stop the recording, actually I did get two questions that were submitted on the chat. So I'm just gonna read those through. Um, and then after that, I can stop the recording so people can ask their questions um, and okay. unmute if they would like. Um, so the first one is, um, are there, uh, is there anything I could do or activities to avoid to reduce chances of shifting or tightening with implants? I feel a lot of tightening uh, of my chest muscles when I lift something heavy. Um, it's uncomfortable and it makes me feel concerned something could go wrong. That's a good question. So um, I would say that in general, um, you know, implants are designed and breast reconstruction in general is designed for you to be able to kind of live your life the way you want to. Um, and so, um, you know, there are certain things that you may be able to avoid. My sense is based on the question that, uh, you know, your implant is below your muscle. So if someone is tightening their chest muscles when they lift something, uh, it causes the implant to shift. It's something called animation deformity. Uh, we didn't talk about it much here, but uh, for uh, someone who um, has an implant underneath the muscle um, and you uh, want to, um, you know, sort of change the position of that. So every time you contract the muscle, the implant doesn't move, uh, then you should be able to, um, you know, sort of change where that implant is. That is a common revisionary procedure we're doing more and more of, of uh, taking the implant, putting it above the muscle, so then those activities um, aren't as limiting or as uncomfortable. Um, you know, the implant's not gonna break by doing those activities. Yes, it may move around a little bit. I guess really the only thing I would say is limit doing those sort of things. At the same time, that is also then changing your lifestyle. And that's not necessarily the goal. Um, so there are ways to work around that in terms of uh, doing a revisional surgery, for example, to change the position of that implant so when that muscle contracts, um, it's not causing the discomfort that you have. 